I am Dr. May, the department head for history and philosophy, and you are obviously here for this talk, Confucian Role Ethics, the Blind Justice Need Moral Imagination. And on behalf of the School of Arts and Letters and the Department of History and Philosophy, I'd like to introduce Dr. Roger Ames of the University of Hawaii. He's a professor of philosophy there. He'll be talking. Uh, his talk will largely be derived from his new book that just came out. Uh, Dr. Ames is a very prestigious fellow. He has authored, edited, and translated over 30 books. And he's a world-renowned speaker. He's spoken at Harvard, Cambridge, uh, at various Chinese universities, and now he's finally fulfilled his lifelong dream of speaking at North Georgia. So without further ado, Dr. A. skyscrapers in Shanghai, more than New York City, with everything that goes along with that. Uh, there's, the, there's the Chinese economy has transformed the world economy. Last year, the G8 became the G20 that have just been meeting in uh, Europe, with Hu Jintao standing in the middle. That, um, that there is a perceptible change in the world economic and political order. And what follows behind that is a change in the world cultural order. That for, for 200 years, this, this uh, antique civilization called China, for imperialistic reasons, for, for economic and political reasons, has not been at the table. And yet, uh, China has a lot to say. And it has to say a lot at a moment in our history where we have the perfect storm, that you have global warming. Uh, uh, six months ago, I was at the CDC talking to a group of American doctors who are on their way to China to work with Chinese doctors on preventing a pandemic of avian flu. Um, that there is, we just, on Monday of this week, we have just seen the seven billion person on the planet, that, um, that we have water shortage and food shortage, and we have these growing inequities in wealth between the very, very rich and the very, very poor. Uh, over the last decade in America, 30% um, uh, more people have fallen into what we consider to be a poverty level. Uh, so it's not that America is immune to this. So you have all of, you have all of these different global warming, these kinds of issues, <coughs> and they all have four things in common. Number one, the human being has something to do with it. Number two, they don't have boundaries. It doesn't matter if you're an American or Chinese or African. If uh, you have a pandemic, it'll kill everybody. Uh, it, and uh, the third thing they have in common is that they're not problems, they're a predicament. Unless you solve all of these problems, you won't solve any of these problems. And so you have to solve them all. And the fourth thing that they have in common is that we have the human resources, the human cultural resources, to, to, uh, to make a change. 
that when you have a predicament, you have to have a change in values, in intentions, and in practices. We have to think differently about the world. And, and we, have to, we have to move from what James Carr calls finite relationships to infinite relationships. What's the difference? <laughs> finite relationships are an opponent and me in a finite period of time according to finite rules playing a game with a winner and a loser. And that's very familiar. That's the way that we think about what it means to be a human being. We live in a world with an ideology of individuality, an ideology of autonomy, an ideology of discreteness. Finite games are me and my daughter um, playing a game where we're not playing the game to win, we're playing the game to strengthen the relationship so that whatever problems, whatever increasingly complex problems we have to deal with, that relationship will enable us to do that. That what we understand in the relationship between a parent and a daughter is that it's win-win or lose-lose. And that's where we're moving. We're moving, we're emerging into a world where you either have a win-win situation or a lose-lose situation. We have to move from the paradigm of individuality and, and individual interests, discrete interests, to the primacy of relationality. That, that, that the, the idea of autonomy, the idea of separateness, is a fiction. That everything that we do in this world is a collaboration between you and the world, between you and other people. That, that everything that we do, you walk, you need the ground to walk, you breathe, you need the air to breathe, you see, you need the sunshine to see. That everything that we do is transactional, organism and environment. Um, so, so relationality is, or association is a fact, is a fact. Everything we do is in association with our environments. What is not a fact is family, community, country. That family, community, country is an achievement. It is something that we do to the fact that we live in association. And so what we're going to be talking about today is uh, Confucian role ethics. Confucian role ethics is a different way of thinking about what it means to achieve moral competence as a human being. That what has happened so far over the last couple of hundred years, if, if we turn the clock back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, at the beginning of the 19th century, there are two forces in the world uh, that, that are defining, that are arbiters of science and civilization in the world, and that is Europe on the one hand and China on the other. And they are competing with each other. The idea that China is backward, that China is, is, is old and China doesn't change, this is a very modern uh, perception of China, very, a very recent perception of China. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about, and, try, and we're going to try to, to understand uh, this, this, this place called China better. That, um, that what I want to suggest is that necessity itself is going to make this way of thinking about what it means to be human uh, an important part of the discussion. China is not a country. When you say that I'm, I'm Chinese, it's not like saying I'm German or I'm Canadian. When you say I'm Chinese, it's much more like saying I'm European. That, that in the north, you say, where are you going? In the south, you say, this isn't the same language. That China is Italy to Russia. That, that you have all different kinds of people, you have, have, uh, different, uh, you have different kinds of, well, in fact, you can sort of think about China as what Europe is trying to do today. Uh, you with the European Union. Europe is adding a country every year. China never separated uh, as, as China is fully 22%, 22.5% of the world's population live within the borders of China, and that doesn't count Vancouver. That doesn't count the uh, South Asia, South, uh, Southeast Asian diaspora. That doesn't count greater China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. So, so you're really talking about a major portion of the world's population. And this tradition really has something to say to us in the, at the beginning of the 21st century. So let me, let me talk about um, 
this idea of an alternative morality. What we've done with China is we have theorized China, conceptualized China, on the basis of Western ideas. That we have overwritten China. So when we talk about Chinese ethics, we often talk about virtue ethics, or we talk about deontal ethics, or we talk about uh, consequential. We use Western categories to talk about it. What the argument today is that China's encounter with Western culture is not its defining moment. That this antique civilization was there long before mm -hmm. it encountered the West, and it has its own strategy for achieving moral confidence. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, and where I want to begin is I want to begin with a passage from the Analects of Confucius that um, has been the centerpiece of a discussion that's been going on in China for the last 10 or 15 years. That books, websites have been written on this one passage from the Analects of Confucius. And um, because it, it sets up a problem that is really at the center of contemporary China's um, growth and development. And that is the problem of corruption. That China has a problem. If we, if we, if we think about the primacy of relationality, then the downside of relationality is the misuse of intimate relationships, is, is corruption. The misuse of intimate relationships is, if I'm the president of North Georgia, and I have a son who is marginally intelligent, but he gets in, and somebody who's really bright doesn't get in, there's something wrong with that. There's something unjust about that. And so, so intimate relationships are fundamental, are hugely important in terms of what it means to be moral. At the same time, they can be abused. And so, in China, a major problem has been the abuse of intimate relationships. Cronyism, old boys uh, network, uh, parochialism, uh, that, kind of, that kind of a problem. Uh, local, officio, uh, local, officios, local officials misusing their uh, power to reward people who, in turn, reward them. Okay, so this passage, the backstory to the passage, is Confucius is a philosopher who has, in the state of Lu, in Shandong province now, um, has his academy and has a whole bunch of students. And, um, and he becomes well known in the China of this time. This is about 500 uh, before the Common Era. And um, he's well known, but the, the political authorities of the state of Lu don't give him a chance. They won't give him a political position. They won't allow him <coughs> to, to try to uh, influence the political life, the social life of the people. And so he gets to be about 50 years old, and he says, I've had it. And so what he does is he, is he travels around China, China at this time, uh, the word Zhongguo is not the Middle Kingdom. Zhongguo dates from this period, and it's the Middle Kingdoms. At this time, there's still 14 states that constitute, and the plains of China that constitute the central states of China. And so he travels around, and he goes to what would be Atlanta in China, and that's Wuhan, you know, uh, the state of Chu. And this guy, the governor of Xi, has learned that Confucius is this moral teacher, this ethical person. He's somebody who has a large following. And so he wants to impress Confucius. He wants to say, I'm the magistrate in this town, and the people in my world are really behaving themselves morally. They're really good ethical people. And so the governor of Xi says to Confucius, in our village, there is true goody-goody. This term, the term gong, zhi gong, means using your body to show how um, moral you are. It's a kind of affect. It's a, a physical uh, representation of your own morality. And so to translate that as, as goody goody um, is licensed, but it sort of gets the, the, um, the message across. When his father stole a sheep, he reported him to the authorities. Confucius replied, Whoa, those who are true in my village conduct themselves differently. A father will cover for his son, and a son will cover for his father 
and being true lies in doing so. So you really have a tension here between the idea that it doesn't matter who stole the sheep, it doesn't matter if it's your cousin or your father or your brother, a thief is a thief. And so you should report them to the authorities. The other side of it is, on Confucius' side, a father covers for his son, a son covers for his father. We don't turn our relatives in to the authorities. So that, there's your tension, you know. The principle of justice, blind, or families first. Family relationships come first. That's the, that's the dilemma that we have. Now, so what is Confucius' position? Is he aiding and abetting? criminals? Is he obstructing justice? Or is he doing what you would do? Would <clears> you, if you learned that your father stole a sheep, would you dial 911? Send the cops. Send the police. We've got a thief. Call the newspaper. Send the newspaper. Take pictures. Let the community know that we have a ne'er-do-well in our midst. Who among us would do that? We would try, probably, to respond to this situation with a little bit more imagination. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk, we want to ask the question, does blind justice need moral imagination? Let, let me just, just stop there for a second. I'll, let me give you sort of a, a, um, a, an example of where we're going. <clears throat> Some time ago, my older son, he was about 14 at the time, one day, He's sitting doing his homework, and he's got this really fancy pen. And so I looked at this pen, and hey, you know, I'm a professor. You know, pens are the instruments of my trade. And so I looked at his pen, and I said, whoa, Jason, very nice pen. He said, yeah, it is nice. I said, where did you get that? And he said, oh, Drew, Drew gave it to me, my friend Drew. And I said, oh, Drew, well, where did Drew get it? Because I'd really like to get one like that. And he said, oh, uh, I, I, I don't know where I go. And I said, well, give Drew a call, you know, because I'd love to get a pen like that. Oh, J Drew's on the North Shore, he's camping. I said, well, just give his dad a call. Oh, his dad's there within camp. You know, you talk like this for a little bit. And then it sort of comes, you think, aha, something's going on here. And so at the end of the day, I took the pen from the store without paying for it. My son took the pen without paying for it. What do you do? What, what do I do under those circumstances? Get a stick? Is that, is that a, a, a good way to deal with it? What would you do under those circumstances? I'll tell you what I did. I said to him, let's go. So the two of us go to the store. He says to the guard at the store, you know, could I see the manager? We go back to the office, and he, with a sheepish face, he says, I took your pen, and I, I didn't pay for it. And the manager says, you, you know, it's people like you that makes Hawaii so expensive for, for, for everybody to live. <laughs> Look at your father, you know, in his red face, you know. What are you doing? You know, you come from a good family, and you do something like that. You let your family down. You let the community down. He said, you know, I could call the police and have them come and, and take you away in a moment, you know. And you deserve that. But, you know, he said, I'm going to let you go with a proviso. Every day, you walk by my store. For a year, you don't step your foot in. You step your foot in here, and you, you go to the police. But every day when you walk by, you think about what you've done here. You know, you've done something really bad. And so he, he really went after him. And, 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 and my, he never, my son never stole anything of you, you know. Moral imagination, that, that it's not good enough simply 